Um, Lord, I ask you to calm my nerves, to speak through me clearly, to give me the, the ears to hear and eyes to see what you're doing in this moment. Father, I pray that you would move through me and that you would speak to your people, that you would feed your sheep, that your word would go forth and change lives and transform lives and lead people to become fully devoted followers of Yeshua. Amen. So, uh, just a little bit of background story for the last couple of weeks. As many of you know, a bunch of us went on a missions trip, and um, I discovered that our congregation has actual rock stars in it. So the people who were on the missions trip, I discovered like Karen and Jetty and Justin and Alex and uh, Shaloma and Emma are actual rock stars. Can we give them a hand? Just like a tireless energy that people were exhibiting. I mean, I'm tired all the time, so it was just like exhausting watching them run all over the camp and do all the things that they were doing, but they did it well. They did it with excellence, so my hat's off to you guys. Um, so I went on this trip, and after I got back from the trip, I got sick. I got the swine flu. Swine flu in Zimbabwe killed 12,000 people in a week last year. So I had never had the flu like this before. It was really strange. It waited right until I got home. Nobody else in my family got it. I had the sweats. I was like losing control of my guts in different ways. And um, I was pretty much laid out solid for a week. I was supposed to preach last week, but I did not. And Matt stepped up and did a great message called Not Lion Lunch. And I encourage you all to go back and listen to that message. Um, in doing so, he took a little bit of my thunder about some of the statistics and stories I wanted to go over, um, especially about how my job is 25% as a spiritual affairs manager, you know, taking care of other people and facilitating their ability to pray for other people, and 75% of the time I had to take care of David Rosenberg. So David is Matt's dad, and he's, he's got some pretty severe ADD, and he's just kind of running all over the camp, you know, working miracles at the same time. So... We never really knew where he was or what he was doing. It's kind of like the Holy Spirit. He just shows up. All of a sudden, a bunch of demons leave, and people are getting up off his stretchers. So, kind of a strange uh, week, but my job as the spiritual affairs manager is to go and, you know, sometimes it feels like I'm just doing paperwork. Sometimes it just feels like I'm filling out forms and making sure everybody has the, the booklets that they give to new believers or making sure everybody, you know, captures the right data, um, you know, making sure people drink enough water. I mean, I'm pastoring them, right? So sometimes I go on these trips and I feel like kind of bored, actually. I mean, it's, it's kind of sad to say it because there's all these crazy miracles happening around me, but I just like, okay, there's one, there's another one, and I write it down and you know, didn't actually get to participate in it. But I want to tell you about one that I actually did get to participate in. So on the first full day of the clinic, the first half day, we saw about 200 people. Um, and we had about 20 salvations in that week. So I was excited about what was going to happen after that. You know, we were gaining momentum. And on the first full day, they had done something that I had never experienced before. People were coming in on stretchers. So that has happened, you know, on other clinics, and I've heard lots of stories, so I'm like, oh boy, here we go, let's see what happens. Um, I actually lost track of David Rosenberg, and I'm looking all over the camp for him, wondering where he is, but he's in the back of the tent on a separate deliverance tent, doing a deliverance and helping a woman who was laid out on a stretcher who had never walked before stand and walk, or she hadn't walked in a long time. And, you know, Matt goes into detail about this last week in last week's sermon. So I watched that happen, and then there was another one that Justin and I participated in, um, where we prayed for a woman whose ankles were so bloated, uh, she couldn't stand. And while we were praying for her, we took out the anointing oil, I rubbed anoint anointing oil on her legs, and we prayed for her, and she stood up, and her ankles were literally shrinking while we were praying for her. They, her shoes, it was insane, her shoes were... Like, her feet were crammed into her shoes, and her feet were overlapping the top of her shoes. So it was actually, her feet were coming over the top of her shoes. And by the time we were done, her shoes were loose. And she got up, and she walked out under her own power. I have a picture of it up on my Facebook page, um, of them taking the stretcher and walking away and saying, well, we don't really need this anymore. Um, but there was one in particular that... Um, 
I saw these other things happening, and I felt like God wanted me to participate on a level that I hadn't previously participated. So, uh, you know, David was doing a deliverance, and, and Justin was with, um, you know, somebody, and they brought somebody in on a stretcher, and it was, it was a woman, and she said she hadn't walked in over a year. She hadn't walked in over a year, and she didn't know why. So she went through the clinic, and the doctor said they couldn't diagnose anything. They weren't really sure what was going on with her. But, you know, as usual with the prayer tent, we get people sent to us, and they say, um, we can't help you, but go to the prayer tent, because God can work. So they send them to the prayer tent. And this woman is back there, and, you know, I, I, I kind of decided to handle the overflow, right? So when David was booked up, I was going to kind of try and do some some pre-deliverance work or start working uh, in prayer and kind of try and diagnose the problem and hand it off to him. Um, and, and this woman is saying she hadn't walked, but there is a, uh, there's a strange duality there where people believe in Yeshua, but they also believe in all of these other things alongside of Yeshua. It's from missionaries coming to Africa for centuries. And then when they leave, the uh, culture's um, creep into the religion, and it becomes a mixture. It becomes what we call in Judaism a shadnitz, a mixture, and how it all kind of gets mixed up. And it, at the end of it, you can't even recognize the Christianity. It's, there's no, there's no scripture involved. Um, people are wearing the women wear these white headscarves that are tied in a certain way, and they say that they're apostolic. The word is imposi, right? They say I'm apostolic, and you think that they're apostolic, like apostolic faith around here. But it's nothing like that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shaman, essentially, a prophet who stands in a field and everybody comes and bows at his feet and listens to everything he says. And he's not reading from scripture and he's not teaching. He's just kind of making stuff up, saying that he's hearing from God. In actuality, he's hearing from something other than God. And this woman said, I believe in this. So, you know, through my translator, I said, the God of Israel wants to heal you. And he wants you to know his son, Yeshua. But he can't because he, he doesn't mix with these other things. He's not compatible with these other things. So I said, do you want to receive Yeshua? Do you want to know Yeshua? And she said, yes. So we prayed for her. And we started praying for her. And I realized that she actually needed to pray. So I started leading her in a prayer. And she repented of believing in this other thing. And she accepted Yeshua. It's great, right? You can clap. And then I felt led to kind of pray for her healing. So, you know, we laid hands on her and we started praying for her healing. And I'm going to say something that's going to freak some of you out. I literally f felt the presence of a demon while we were praying for her healing. It sounds kind of weird. I understand. But listen, supernatural stuff is all over the TV. If you can believe in a TV show called Paranormal and Ghost Hunters and all this other stuff... People are naturally spiritually sensitive, some of us. And I'm not saying I'm like a superhero or anything like that, but sometimes you get feelings. And in this instance, I got a feeling. I felt like the Holy Spirit was showing me that there was a demon afflicting this woman. Now, every time when we do um, these, these, these uh, clinics, I take everyone around a walk. And we go all the way around the clinic and we declare the rules right, around the clinic. So this is a place where God's spirit's going to work. There's not going to be any demonic manifestations or anything like that. And then we walk through the tent, and we pray over, uh, over, through the clinic, and we pray over each tent, and then we pray over the leadership of the clinic. And then we go into the prayer tent, and we do the same thing, and we lay down the rules. There are no crazy manifestations in this place, right? So book of Acts kind of stuff. No demoniacs. And there it was. I sensed it. So we rebuked it, and we prayed for this woman to be healed in the name of Yeshua. And she stood up. And she stood up, and she was walking around the back of this prayer tent. I, you know, it couldn't have been more than like 15 by 15 in this side little room that we had. And she's walking around in a circle. And she starts picking up speed, and we ask her friend, is this normal? She goes, no, she hasn't done this in a long time. So we start talking to the friend. We notice that she has the headscarf and she believes the same thing. And we start trying to lead her to the Lord. And then I go to look for the woman and she's gone. She took off. She was wearing this big pink hat and I ran out the back of the tent and I saw her and she was all the way down the field like, 
I can walk again. <laughs> it was an incredible story. And, uh, you know, the way that the Lord prepared me for this is, um, you know, when we were getting ready to go on this trip and I was asked to be the spiritual affairs manager for this trip, I started asking the Lord, like, you know, what's, what's your plan? What's the plan? What do you want to have happen here? And, you know, he didn't say anything to me for a couple of months. And I just said, okay, well, it's just going to be another one of those clinics where I kind of sit back like a uh, spiritual pit boss and make sure everybody has what they need. And we were all up here, and it was Janet and Kelly and Matt Guile were praying over the team. And I felt the Lord say to me this verse in Matthew chapter 4. You can all turn there. Um, you can kind of keep your finger in it because we're going to jump around. But in Matthew chapter 4, verse, six, verse 16, it says, The people sitting in darkness have seen a great light. Those sitting in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And then it goes on to talk about how Yeshua began his ministry. From then on, Yeshua began to proclaim, Turn away from your sins, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So, sitting here and I was trying to wonder what God was trying to get out of me. Like, what are you, why are you putting this verse on me? And we're sitting on the plane and, you know, flying this very long flight and I have a bad back and I, you know, I can't sleep on planes. So this verse is kind of like echoing over and over and over in my head. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Those sitting in the shadow of death on them has that light shined. Over and over and over again. And finally we got there. We started doing ministry. And you started to realize People are sitting, literally, the Lemba people who are there, are sitting literally in the shadow of death. They believe things that are consistent with the forces of spiritual darkness. They believe things that separate them from God. Now, over there, it's a little different because demons, you know, I, I feel, it's kind of strange talking about demons, right? Like, kind of casually, but it's the truth. These things happen. There are demonic forces that oppress people. Their mission is from Satan to try and separate you from God and destroy you. And over there, they're kind of like peacocks. They strut their stuff. They say, I'm a demon, and I've seen it different times in the tents, and Matt and I do deliverance sometimes uh, here in Seattle, where occasionally one of them will start acting like he's a big deal. But they're not really a big deal. God's the big deal. So these people are coming in, and they're spiritually afflicted, and they are uh, physically afflicted because of their spiritual beliefs. And then on top of that, this goes on. I mean, there's Islam there. There's a duality there, like I talked about earlier. People believe in Yeshua, but they also believe in this other darkness. And what I realized from reading this passage and watching all of these happen, is all of these things happen, is that God wants to lead people out of this darkness and in to their destiny. That is the title of my sermon, From Darkness to Destiny. Now look, the, the Lemba people have a prophetic destiny. We would like to call it a prophetic destiny. They are the people who were scattered. They're scattered tribes. They left uh, during the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah purged um, the Jews among them who had married people from the nations, and he said either, you know, send them out and stay or go with them. So some of the people left, and they wandered, and they wandered through the Middle East, and some of them wandered into Asia and different places, and then others of them wandered through Africa all the way down the coast and settled in Zimbabwe and South Africa, Mozambique, and Zambia, different communities throughout Africa. And it's actually really interesting because technically there are only 16 million Jews in the world, but if you were to factor in these other people who carry the DNA and the gene of the Cohen, there are 51 extra million people. So God has a prophetic destiny for these people. This prophetic destiny started with Abraham and the promises that God made to Abraham, and then God gave Abraham a, a son, and then his son had, had sons and there's, there's 12 tribes of Israel, and this just keeps going on and on. And God is showing his faithfulness, and he has a prophetic destiny for all of the people who are called Israel. And their prophetic destiny was to first bring forth the Messiah, to reveal God's truth in the form of a human being, and then to be regathered at the end of time. So this is happening. This is happening 
right in front of our eyes, people who are scattered and alienated from God, who, who are called to be the Jewish people, but don't know that they are, or are separated from it, are coming to know their Messiah in a real-time, physical, and spiritual context. And I, I kept on going back and forth, and I don't really understand, Lord, like, what what you're trying to get across to me in this verse, because I can be pretty thick-headed and jet-lagged and all of these other things. So I'm sitting there in this prayer tent trying to figure out what God's saying, and he led me back to where this passage came from, is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. The people walking in darkness will see a great light. Upon those dwelling in the land of the shadow of death, light will shine. So there it is. It's also uh, paraphrased in Isaiah 60 in the song we sang during worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Though the whole world sits in darkness, upon you I will shine a great light. And then, if you go down, this is a famous passage that's read, read all over the world at Christmas time. For unto us, in verse 5, unto us a child is born, a son will be given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God my father of eternity, prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and shalom, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness from now until forevermore. The zeal of Adonai Sevaot, the Lord of hosts, will do this. So when you read this, this is a prophecy about the prophetic destiny of the people of Israel and the prophetic destiny of us. Because when the Spirit of God reveals the Messiah, the point is for us to be able to know this God, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Father of Eternity. And then, as we become fully devoted followers of Yeshua, he desires us to be able to lead people to become, other people to become fully devoted followers of Yeshua, to introduce them to that God, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Father of Eternity, the wonderful counselor. But the problem is, just like those people, we get stuck in darkness. So I, I, I don't, I wasn't going to share this, but my first experience with like the idea of spiritual darkness, something that is utterly dark, happened to me when I was very young. And um, my father, as many of you know, was an was a, um, expat from Afghanistan. He fled spiritual, I'm sorry, um, political oppression, and he left and he walked to Turkey. And he lived outside of Afghanistan for many years. He didn't go back. And in the, in the mid-90s, he got to go back for a short time for a visit under a guy named General Dostum, who was uh, featured in the movie 12 Strong, if you ever want to go look at it. It has Thor in it. <laughs> the actor who plays Thor, not the actual Thor. And my father went back, and he was the happiest I've ever seen him. And then shortly after that, the Taliban came in, and the Taliban killed 6,000 people in my father's village. This is going to be graphic, so if you can't handle it, cover your ears. They took the women and the children, and they raped the women and the children, and then they killed the women and the children in front of the men, and then they took the men, and they killed most of the men, and some of them, they took their eyes and cut off their hands and feet and left them there so that they could tell people who had done this thing. And I, I watched my father go through this, and his, his hair turned white, you know? Like, before it was like mine, maybe a little bit kind of headed that way, but he turned shock white after that. Everyone he had known, everyone he had grown up with, everyone who had survived the Soviets was dead. Evil. Pure evil, pure spiritual darkness. And you don't even have to go back there. You know, even back here in Seattle, a couple of, uh, this week, somebody was posting white supremacist flyers all over the synagogues in South Seattle. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. And sometimes our response to it is, well, we just need to vote better. We need to vote, we need to vote these people out of office and vote these other people into office. But that fails to grasp the problem. There is a preternatural, and by preternatural, I mean abnormal to normal. Abnormal to natural. Not supernatural, because God is supernatural, but preternatural. Indication of demonic activity. Forces at work, here in our own city, in our own country. And, and, and they're hell-bent on leading us away from God. 
They're hell-bent on bringing death and destruction. And the problem is, we can get kind of immune to it. We can grow cold to it. We see it every day. I see it on my Facebook feed, and I see something awful, and I just want to flick past it because it's too hard to deal with. It's too hard to look at. It's too hard to grasp a mind that would walk into a Walmart and shoot people just based on the color of their skin. And then everyone wants to run out and, you know, ban a gun or, 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 blame, a, or blame a politician or do any of these other things. And listen, I'm not talking about the, the nuts and bolts solutions. If we don't ever acknowledge the problem that the people in this country and the people all over the world are walking away from God, away from his light, and into spiritual darkness, there will never be an answer. There will never be an answer because you will try to legislate morality and you will try and impose your will and your solutions on other people and it's never going to work because people, they don't change. You don't ever actually deal with the evil. You don't ever actually deal with the corrupt heart, the heart that's given itself over to this kind of spiritual darkness. Now, I believe our destiny as believers in Yeshua is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Yeshua. I try to live that everywhere I go. If I'm in Zimbabwe and I'm trying to, you know, facilitate uh, a bunch of people trying to intercede for the souls of people in Zimbabwe, that's our goal, to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Yeshua, to walk them into the relationship, to bring them to a place of deliverance, to bring them to a place of healing. And then after we leave, they equip these people and train them and teach them the scriptures and plant them in congregations. But things always inevitably get in the way. I don't want to talk about that for a minute. You go back to Matthew chapter 4. You know, that verse that I read you earlier is kind of like a, a platitude. The people sitting in darkness have seen a great light. Those sitting in the shadow of death on them as that light shined. And it's, it's a prophetic word, and it's kind of hard for us to deal with prophetic words sometimes. But when you understand that the Bible is a book of contrasts, and there's a contrast between night and dark and good and evil, that this too is a contrast. Here at the beginning of Matthew chapter 4, it says in verse 1, Then Yeshua was led by the Ruach into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are Ben Elohim, the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But he replied, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed them on the highest point of the temple. If you are Ben Elohim, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall command his angels concerning you, and upon their hands they shall lift you up, so that you may not strike your foot against the stone. Yeshua said to him again, again it is written, you shall not put out or nigh your God to the test. And then the devil takes him to a very high place and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And then Yeshua said to him, go away, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship Adonai, your God, and him only you shall serve. And then the devil left, leaves him and behold, angels came and began to take care of him. So prior to this, Yeshua had just been immersed in the Jordan. And the Spirit of God came upon him like a dove. And, and God physically spoke. It's, it's a bot call. It's a sound from heaven. The voice of God from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. So for many of us, that would be like, that's so great. It's a Lion King moment. I just can't wait to be king. He's going to be the king. He's God's son. He's the Messiah. And then he started his ministry, and, and thousands of people followed him, and he got healed, and then they made him king, and story over, except it didn't go like that. He went into the desert. He went into the desert to deal with the enemy of our souls. He went in to conquer evil once and for all. And he went in, and he weakened himself so that he could be more spiritually sensitive to what's going on. He fasted, he prayed, he humbled himself for God his Father. And the devil came upon him in a moment of weakness. And I'd like to believe that it was probably, it's the sixth week of his fast. So this is in the middle, and by then you're getting nice and hungry. And he's out in the wilderness, and it's nice and hot. And this is one of those supernatural fasts, no food, no water. You and I can't do that. 
This is something that only the Son of God himself could carry. And the first thing he says is, will God actually provide for you? Will God actually take care of you? Nope. He won't take care of you. You should go take care of yourself. You need to go do this yourself. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and take care of this. But Yeshua says, kind of paraphrasing a little bit, not only will God provide for me physically, he's all I need spiritually. He's more than what I need. He's more than enough. So then when he realizes he can't get through to Yeshua in that way, and that Yeshua is responding to him with scriptures from the Torah portion that week, he says, all right, fine. You want to believe in scripture? I'm going to twist this one all up for you. It says that if you jump from here, God will command his angels concerning you, and upon their hands they shall lift you up, so that they might not strike your feet against the stone. So just jump, man, because you're the son of God. Prove it to me. And Yeshua is like wise in this moment because he's able to say, you're twisting the scriptures. You're trying to make them into something that they're not. And I'm not going to put God to the test by doing that. I know God, and I don't need to test him. I believe in him. And then he takes him up onto the Mount of Temptation. And I've been there. It's in Jericho. It's actually, Jericho is like a really, really desolate looking place. It's super dry. There's only one spring there. It's um, Elisha's spring from uh, Elisha the prophet in the Old Testament. And it's just such a strange place because it's so old. And there's this giant looming mountain in the back. And that's where they say that Yeshua went up, was taken up to. And you can literally see everything. It is on the, the southern end of the kingdom. And you can see the entire kingdom from this place. And he says, I... If you bow down and you worship me, I'll give all of this to you. And what's he offering him? A shortcut. If you take the easy way out, if you take the spiritual shortcut, and if you just fall down and worship me, I'll make you king. You'll have all of this. Was it really his to give? We don't really know. But really what he was trying to do was take advantage of a person who was physically in his flesh weakened and try and convince him that pride and ego are the way out of your problems. Listen, God wants to be the king in your life. He wants to be the king in your life. But a lot of us are in a place where we're stuck on this last one, and we say, you know what? I know the king, but I'm also the king of my life. I get to sit on the throne, and God's like my co-king. And it doesn't work that way. That's what spiritual darkness is. It's a deception. It obscures truth. It leads you away from God and God's glory and doing things in the light of God's presence or walking away from them and choosing complacency, and choosing pride. And I think that's really like the issue here in America and in the West. You know, we're very familiar with the word. There are Bibles everywhere. Uh, we don't see miracles on the scale that we do in Africa, but we do have a general understanding because many of our societies have been founded on the idea of Christianity. But the truth of the matter is, there's a smugness built into the human soul. There's a pride. I know all that. But you want to be one of those weird religious people. You want, to, you, you, want to, you want to practice that weird religion. You even go on Saturday. What's up with that? It's so weird. The truth of the matter is, it's the same kind of darkness. It's the same kind of darkness that we have to be honest with God about what that darkness is and how it works in our life and how we intend to deal with it. Or we get stuck there. And God doesn't want us to get stuck there. He doesn't want us to get stuck in these places. See, his purpose in our life is to bring about glory, the glory of God in our lives, right? The glory of God in your life, in your life, in your life, in my life. And to make his presence known to the rest of the world. It's very simple. When we do these deliverances, it's usually the last thing we hear, the Holy Spirit speaking. What is your purpose in person X life? It's to glorify God through this person. Boom, mic drop, Holy Spirit speaking. It's not to make this person an evangelist. It's not to make this person famous. It's not to give this person a career or this or this or this or that or to elevate the person. It elevates God every time. And that's what God wants to do in your life because that is your destiny. That is your destiny. 
Your destiny is to walk with him every day of your life and to become a fully devoted follower of Yeshua. And there are nuances in that because some of you have a hand-picked, actually all of us have a hand-picked destiny. God handcrafted a destiny for each one of us. He has a, a destination in mind for us. It's a destination wedding. Check that out. Where we get to know him and we get to be with him in heaven and along the way he takes us along the wisest path because he's the wonderful counselor. He bulldozes our opposition because he's the mighty God. He shows us glimpses of eternity because he's the father of eternity. And he helps us to walk in a daily peace because he is the prince of peace. That's your destiny, to walk with him, to figure it out along the way. But the problem is, and Yeshua knew this, in John chapter 3, I'm going to back up to John chapter 3. 3 verse 16. I know that you guys don't have that up there. And this is also a very, another famous passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned, but the one whoever but whoever does, does not believe he has been condemned already because he has not put his trust in the name of the one and only Son of God, Ben Elohim. This is where I want to go with this. Now this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love their darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will not be exposed. But whoever practices the truth comes to the light so that they may be known be made known that his deeds have been accomplished in God. That his deeds have been accomplished in God. See, listen, I'm a sinner. And for many years, I practiced, I practiced sin. I didn't just practice it. I sought it out. And now that I'm a believer in Yeshua, I have to deal with sin. The sin doesn't go away. I have addictive tendencies in my personality. I have to deal with them. I have to deal with them. I have to continually bring them before the Lord. I just had minor surgery this week on top of having all of the flu, and they gave me some uh, Percocet. I have to be careful with Percocet. I have to be careful with these things because I have a history of abusing them. So maybe it's not like that for you. Maybe it's not addiction. But maybe you have other areas, places where you feel like you're stuck in darkness, and it's blocking you from entering into your destiny. And these are the very things that God wants to deal with. Not to shame you, not to make you feel bad in the sense that you're like just going to humiliate you. It's all part of his plan to remove the darkness from your life and help you to step one step at a time into the light of his countenance, into his plan for your life, into your destiny. But we have to be honest. We have to be honest with God. We have to be honest that these things are here. We can't just sit there and say, okay, you know what? Um, God took me this far, but I'm tired. So I'm going to take my foot off the pedal and allow myself to coast for a while. Or he doesn't really care about that little thing, that little secret that I have that I go into my room and lock the door and do. For men, it's pornography. For women, it's all kinds of different things. I don't want to get into specifics, women. I love you all. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, all of those things block you from becoming a fully devoted follower of Yeshua. And you have to be willing to deal with it. You have to. You have to be honest with God. And my encouragement to you this week is to do that. Is to do that, to lay your life out before the Lord and ask him very earnestly, what is holding me back? What darkness am I holding on to that is keeping me from my destiny? See, that woman who got up and walked off the stretcher that week. That was her destiny. She didn't even know it. She didn't even know who Yeshua was, really. She was following something that wasn't Yeshua, that she thought was Yeshua. And then she came in, and God's destiny for her was to know him, to be delivered, to be set free of her oppression and her physical illness, and to get up and walk. That's a snapshot of what your life could be like. These areas that we hold on to that we don't think God wants to break through on.
but he absolutely wants to break through on it because that's his destiny for your life. The Son of Man came so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. That's his plan. And he wants that for you, and he wants that for me, and he wants that for all of us. But if we're acting in fear and afraid to let him have our sins and afraid to let him actually deal with the problems that are in our lives, we're not going to get any traction. We're going to be stuck in that dark place, sitting in the shadow of death and allowing evil to have its way with us. Now look, some of you are in a very different place. And I want to make sure I bring this up. Some of you are in relationships with people who, have, who are practicing sin, and their sin is causing you to stumble and separating your faith. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe, maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, 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 or a relationship, a friendship, or one of these things, or, or, or even like a, a parent or a grandparent or a family figure that has an influence in your life that's dark. They're practicing darkness. And that darkness is spilling over into your life and disrupting your life and causing you pain and sorrow and causing you to doubt God and God's plan for you. And I want to encourage you that that's not God's intention. God has given you spiritual authority to be able to speak to these things if you're a believer in Yeshua. To be able to say, you know what, Satan? Get away from me. Get behind me because the word of God says this. And all the things that you're saying about me and all the things that this evil is trying to bring into my life, I don't want it anymore because I want to be connected to the Father who's taking me out of that darkness and walking me towards my destiny. Can I get an amen? Listen to me. Listen to me. You don't have to stay stuck in that cycle. You don't have to stay stuck in that place. God wants to liberate you. He died so that you could have freedom. He died so that you could have eternal life and victory over sin. This is his destiny for you. This is his destiny for you. Spend this week asking the Lord, what's the destiny you have for me? What are the things that are blocking me? Is it me? Is it someone else? Is it a relationship I have? Is it an attitude I have? Is it greed? Is it, is, it, is it envy? Is it pride? Is it lust? Is it anger? What is it? What's keeping me from walking in the fullness of that destiny? And then turn to him and say, take it from me. Show me, Lord, how to walk away from it and walk towards you. Take me to my destiny. Let me pray for you. Father, I know that there are people who are struggling with this and I know that you want to liberate them. They're either struggling with sin in their own lives or it's sin that other people are practicing and it's, it's spilling over into their lives and, and frankly messing up their lives. And I just ask you, Lord, that you would come with the power of your spirit, rebuke the darkness with your voice clearly in their lives. Rebuke the things that are keeping them away from their destiny, keeping them anchored in that darkness. Show them, Lord, that they can take a step away from that darkness by the power of your spirit and into the light of who you are and all of your plans for them. Show them their destinies, Lord. Show them their destinies and show them who you are to them, how much you love them, and what your plans are for them so that they can know you all the days of their lives so that they can walk through you through this life knowing the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God, the father of eternity and rely on you in that way with that knowledge and that understanding of that's who you are and that's what you want to be to them. Walk them through the landmine of life, landmines of life, Lord, and into that safe place with you, that place where they're strong, strong, fully devoted followers of Yeshua. In Yeshua's name, amen.